You know, actually, I'm very excited to be here. I had uh, broken my arm while I was out uh, bicycling with my uh, cockapoo on July 6th and had thought I was going to have to uh, cancel coming. Uh, an agreement with my spouse was that uh, she would decide on this last Monday if I was fit to travel. And fortunately for me and for you guys, she said, yes, you're good to go. So here I am. Uh, so here are my disclosures. I do clinical research. I have grant funding from Direct MS Charity. It's a uh, group out of Canada uh, that uh, believes there's a link between nutrition and MS. Uh, DJO Incorporated, which makes uh, electrical therapy devices. Pinnacle Life, uh, which is a supplement company. TZ Press, which is a publication company. I own the copyrights uh, to my book, Mining My Mitochondria, and I do have some more copies. I know I sold out of them uh, last night, so we could talk about that afterwards uh, at lectures. I have trademarks to the Walls Diet, the Walls Protocol. I have a patent pending on the therapeutic garment uh, that we use for electrical therapy. Uh, and I have equity interest in a number of companies that are trying to advance these uh, concepts commercially. And I have a medical license, which I have to protect, uh, so the uh, Food and Drug Administration does not come after me. So I always make this uh, disclaimer, uh, and those of you in clinical practice are going to advocate for non-USDA approved diets, I advise you to make these disclaimers as well. Uh, the FDA has not evaluated any of the claims or statements made in this presentation on my website, in my books, or by me. Nor are these statements uh, and claims intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Only FDA-approved drug, diet, and devices can legally make such claims. This is all about education. The Walls Diet recommends nine or more servings of vegetables and fruit per day, which is more than what the American Dietetics uh, Association recommends. And there's quite a few more recommendations that I have that you'll hear about. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Edison uh, said this uh, 100 years ago, that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patient in the care of the human frame and a proper diet and the cause and prevention of disease. Uh, and sad to say, that is not what is happening. Uh, physicians like myself were very much uh, in love with drugs, diets, and devices. And we know very little about nutrition. And we know very little about how to create health. If we go back further uh, to a Chinese proverb, uh, that was the superior doctors prevent disease, mediocre doctors treat impending disease, and the inferior doctor treats actual disease. Now, by that standard, US medicine is really inferior. In most of my medical career, I was inferior and very occasionally mediocre. Uh, never did I teach my patients how to achieve real health. And I was exactly that kind of physician until I became ill, uh, having secondary progressive MS, uh, get becoming profoundly disabled, was the most profound gift I've ever received. So I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting uh, MS in 2000 when I began uh, stumbling. I was actually quite relieved uh, because I'd been having to decrease my uh, workouts and my Nordic track steadily, so it's like, okay, so I'm not a slug after all. Uh, in 2002, I discovered Lauren Cordain uh, and went paleo. Got rid of the gluten, got rid of the dairy, got rid of the grain, and I still declined. In 2003, I needed my uh, tilt recline wheelchair. By 2007, I was so disabled I could not sit in a standard chair like this. I needed to be in a recliner or in bed. And I could walk only short distances with two canes. Uh, you know, being an academic doc, I went out and got the best care possible. I went to one of the best MS centers uh, in the country for a second opinion, the Mellon Center, which is at Cleveland Clinic. I took the latest, newest drugs. Um, uh, I took, uh, when I got into the wheelchair, I was told to take chemotherapy in the form of Novantrone, which I took. Uh, and then I took Tizabri. Uh, and then when that was pulled from the market, I switched to Celsep. So I was taking disease-modifying drugs. Uh, at that time, uh, it was apparent to me that the best medicine wasn't stopping the trajectory, uh, and I would likely become bedridden by my disease. Uh, I had two young kids. I was the primary breadwinner, uh, and felt like if I'm going to, I need to do everything that I possibly can, which meant uh, I needed to start reading. And so at night, when I got home from work, I would log on to PubMed.gov, 
and I started reading. Uh, in the midst of uh, brain fog, and of course, you know, the half-life of medical care is uh, five years, you know, uh, it turns over 50%, we think, in five to 10 years. So all these basic science concepts, many of them were new, I'd never heard of, or I'd fallen asleep through them. So there was a whole lot of learning for me. Uh, and uh, some of the things that I saw, uh, I was looking for the brain models of diseases in which the brains shrink, so, because with MS, your brain and spinal cord shrinks over time. I was reading about the animal models of Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, Alzheimer's dementia, and Lou Gehrig's disease, because in all those things, the brains were shrinking. And I saw that the mitochondria were not working very well, leading to early uh, signals for apoptosis or death of the brain cell. Uh, and with more reading, I found articles that had protected uh, little mice brains and their mitochondria and that they had survived longer in all those various animal models. So I started adding a variety of vitamins and supplements. And the speed of my decline slowed. I was very grateful, but I was still declining. In 2007, I discovered an organization called the Institute for Functional Medicine. And for those physicians and healthcare providers who are here, I strongly urge you to check out this organization. Uh, I think you'd find uh, a lot of uh, uh, use in that organization. They had a course called Neuroprotection, a Functional Medicine Approach for Common and Uncommon Neurological Syndromes. Uh, I took that course, learned a lot, deepened my understanding. I'm going to summarize uh, now very quickly what I learned in my own reading and through the functional medicine folks to help you understand um, what I began to create. Okay, first thing, uh, MS uh, and most of the diseases of uh, modern civilization are related to our diet and our environment. Walter Willett, a uh, big honcho here, I believe at Harvard, uh, wrote in Science, a top uh, journal, uh, balancing lifestyle and genomics research for disease prevention. He says, we've been able to identify modifiable behavioral factors, including specific aspects of diet, overweight, inactivity, and smoking that account for over 70% of stroke and colon cancer, over 80% of heart disease, and 90% of adult onset diabetes. And there's another article that uh, looked at the risk of uh, multiple sclerosis, that if you have a sibling, your risk is 5%. A parent, your risk is 3%. If you have two parents, your risk is 30%. Always it's the environmental factors that are the most important driver. So that uh, gives me great hope that there are things under my control that I could do something about. Uh, we know, or actually I should tell you guys, uh, we think the problem with MS is that my immune cells are really screwed up and they are attacking the myelin, which is the fatty insulation on the wiring between my brain cells and between the cells of my spinal cord. That damage leads to a breakdown of the communication, which leads to sensory problems or problems with uh, muscle coordination and strength. In addition, there's some interesting literature that says the blood's too thick when you have MS as compared to the other folks. And of course, lots of information that says there's too many uh, inappropriate inflammation molecules in the bloodstream and in the brain. And the, these are just some of those references for that. Uh, what we also know is the blood you eat has a big impact on the viscosity or the thickness of your blood and the number of inflammation molecules. Now in medical school, I had to memorize countless uh, reactions involving my mitochondria. Um, what I didn't learn and wasn't taught were what substrates my cells could make and what substrates I had to eat for those reactions to happen properly. Uh, here's the, the quick version. It's B vitamins, a lot of minerals, in particular sulfur, uh, and a bunch of antioxidants. So myelin is what's being attacked uh, by your immune cells and being destroyed, leading to uh, problems with MS. Uh, and your brain is continually trying to repair that myelin. To repair the myelin, you need a lot of these things. Uh, vitamin B1, which is thiamine, B9, which is folate, B12, which is cobalamin, omega-3 fatty acids, in particular docosahexanoic acid, and iodine. And this is from uh, the uh, article Boer, uh, and he's talking about old brains. 
Now, you also need to activate the next brain cell in the line of the communication uh, in your brain, in your spinal cord, and on out uh, to the periphery. To do that, you need a, a rich supply of amino acids, uh, sulfur, and vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine. This is a terrific article, which I didn't have at the time that I was creating my diet, but we uh, have it when we created our study diet. It looks at uh, the nutrient biomarker patterns, that's blood levels of all sorts of nutrients, how well you think, and the size of your brain in old farts. The mean age, I believe, was 87, okay? And people had to be uh, relatively healthy to be in this study. What they saw is, and this is no surprise, the more vitamins, minerals, essential fats, and antioxidants in your bloodstream, the better you could think and the more brain tissue you had. They also measured some anti-nutrients, hydrogenated fats, uh, which, by the way, you can make in your own frying pan if you heat up vegetable oils. Uh, and if you have a higher trans fat level in your blood, you're stupider, that is, you perform less well on those thinking tests, and your brain is smaller. So between uh, the Bowman article and the Boer articles, there are 31 vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, and antioxidants that I knew that my brain needed uh, in my mitochondria needed. So I had a long list of supplements. I uh, am still going downhill, but I'm going downhill much more slowly. And then uh, when you think of that list of 31, and you look at the NHANES data, and uh, Dr. Cordain had uh, done this nicely, uh, what you're able to see is, and study after study shows this, uh, Americans, uh, we eat so poorly. Half of us are missing our B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin A, two-thirds are missing our minerals, magnesium, calcium, zinc, iodine, and 80% are missing the omega-3 fats. So we're setting our brains up to be more stupid and smaller. And by the way, we're trying to really accelerate that for our children. <laughs> and that's because this is the stuff that we eat, a lot of processed food, uh, white sugar, white flour, high fructose corn syrup, and trans fats. And that's why one in three kids uh, born today or be uh, severely obese, diabetic as children or young adults, or one in two if you're African American. And of course, this group knows that's not how humans evolved. We spent two and a half million years as foragers uh, eating leaves, roots, berries, meat, fish, a lot of it hard, tough, chewy, and we had to work pretty damn hard for our food. And in study after study that has looked at the hunter-gatherers, uh, they have a very uh, varied diet uh, that each society had learned how to identify which plants you eat, which animals you eat, which parts of the animals you eat, which parts you don't eat, what's poisonous, what's good for you, and they knew how to optimize the health of their clan. Now, of course, and of course, the other thing that uh, I'm humbled by uh, is that these ancients knew far more about eating for maximum health than we physicians. Uh, the ancestral diets have more nutrition per calorie than the American Heart Association diet, the American Diabetes Association diet, the My Pyramid diet, or the My Healthy Plate diet. So, um, I need to set, set you up for this. In 2002, I'm paleo. There's no grain, no legumes, no dairy. I'm still going downhill. I'm adding supplements. The speed of my downhill decline has slowed. In the summer of 2007, I uh, start a uh, very comprehensive uh, intervention. Well, I'll tell you more about that when I uh, explain the research. Uh, and one of those interventions was I uh, took that list of 31 nutrients, looked at the diet and said, you know, I'm going to use what I learned from my reading of the basic science from functional medicine to design a diet that gives me those 31 nutrients using the paleo principles. So uh, what, we, what I created uh, is what follows. And you think of uh, a big manly dinner plate. This is not a salad plate. This is a big manly dinner plate. When you heap it all up, you can't see the bottom, that's three cups. And so I start with greens. Uh, because I want uh, a rich supply of uh, B vitamins, vitamins A, C, and K in particular. 
uh, and a great source of minerals. Uh, some of the things that all those good nutrients do for you, uh, we have studies that show us uh, adding beets, uh, that's the beetroot and the beet green, greens and berries, protect blood vessels. The endothelial cells that line the blood vessels are much healthier uh, and perform more effectively when you add these uh, items to the diet. Uh, some great studies that have come out that vitamin K, particularly K2, which is what your gut bacteria will do, if, assuming you have the correct mix, uh, if you're eating a lot of greens, they'll make something called vitamin K2 MK7. And uh, that's very important in blood vessel health, the health of your uh, heart valves, your bones, and making myelin. Uh, some very interesting studies that uh, vitamin K2 lowers the risk of uh, little mice getting the animal model of MS known as experimental autoimmune encephalitis. It also, by the way, lowers the risk of cataracts and macular degenerations, which is a leading cause of blindness. Uh, cabbage family, onion family, sulfur vegetables, uh, mushrooms, asparagus, so a plate full of other non-starchy vegetables rich in sulfur. These are the things that give you bad gas uh, and have the guys wanting to light their farts uh, <laughs> at college dorm parties. Okay, so what's good about this food? Uh, again, this helps improve blood fluidity and the endothelial function of your blood vessels. More articles for the same. Uh, colors are rich in flavonoids, flavonol, flavonols, polyphenols, antioxidants. You can get them from uh, vegetables, or you can get them from berries. Uh, and to be colored in my world, you have to be colored all the way through. Apples, pears, bananas are not colored, and they are not part of my uh, dietary scheme here. Uh, when you have intense color, uh, more antioxidants, it's great for your mitochondria. Uh, there are great studies showing this improves cognition, uh, it's important for retinal health, and it's uh, an important part of the processing and elimination of toxins. Uh, you guys all know that we need DHA, which is an omega-3 fat, that docosahexanoic acid, so we can have a big brain. It's also very important in the mid-face development, uh, so you have a nice, broad, dental arch, straight teeth. Uh, you get this in wild fish, wild shellfish, and to a lesser degree in uh, grass-fed meat, raw. When you cook it, you do uh, lose it. Uh, so grass-fed meat, of course, has more omega-3 fatty acids, but you wanna have it raw. The more you cook it, the more you lose. Organ meats. Uh, our primitive ancestors knew that organ meats were a critical part of the diet. Uh, I think about a third of their protein calories would come from organ meats. Heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, uh, they ate, ate it all. Uh, they would even uh, chew up the uh, small intestine, having sort of a game of uh, chewing it up at both ends and seeing who could raise uh, meat in the middle. I think that was only the small bowel, though. I don't think that was the large bowel. Okay? Uh, so, here's a, here is a comparison of some of the nutrients that you get in 100 grams of an apple, broccoli, or liver. And it's no surprise that the broccoli has a lot more uh, vitamins and minerals than the apple, because the apple's sugary sweet, it has uh, more carbohydrates in it. And sort of in general, you go up by a factor of 10. And then when you go to the liver, in general, you go up by a factor of 10 again. You have a lot more of the fat-soluble vitamins. You have more of the B vitamins. And you have a very uh, bioavailable source of minerals, uh, magnesium, zinc, uh, calcium. But you don't want to cook it too much. The more you cook it, the more you destroy those water-soluble vitamins. Our ancestors knew to travel or trade to get access to seaweed. Seaweed is a great source of iodine. Now, one billion of the world's inhabitants are deficient in their iodine, and they've lost uh, 15 IQ points as a result. 
you need iodine to make myelin, uh, toxin, eliminate toxins, heavy metals, and to reduce your cancer risk. Food allergies are hard to diagnose. My daughter made this for me with dairy and gluten. I shall conquer the world, Lord Voldemort. Now, <laughs> he's the bad guy, okay? Uh, here's just a sampling of some of the uh, articles, case reports about bad brain problems that got better uh, when the person went on a gluten-free diet. Uh, problems with motor neuropathy, psychiatric disorders, autism, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, seizures. Harry Potter, the boy who ate kale. <laughs> Voldemort met his match. Uh, J.K. Rowling's mother died of MS. I think she'd be very happy to have Harry defeat MS using herbology. Okay, so here's my quick story. 2007, five years being paleo. Tilt reclined wheelchair, have to live in a uh, zero gravity chair, losing my keys, losing my phone, uh, having a detailed daily planner, thinking that I'm gonna be forced out of work here very soon. That's when I reorganized my diet. I am using uh, vitamin supplements, uh, massage, meditation, exercise, electrical stimulation of my muscles. I have a comprehensive program that I've started. Nine months later, I can bicycle uh, 18 miles with my family. The following year, I do a trail ride in the Canadian Rockies. I begin speaking to the public. And in 2010, I have a clinical trial and I've got funding uh, to start this trial. Uh, we enroll people with secondary progressive MS. Uh, in our second wave, we've now started uh, enrolling people with primary progressive MS. Uh, we're using the Walls diet. We have a, uh, a bunch of vitamins and supplements. I'm teaching folks to do self-massage, meditation, exercise, neuromuscular electrical stim. Now, to get my study approved, uh, we had to show the dietitians that my diet was okay. So we did a 24-hour recall on my diet. Uh, so we've got uh, three days history for me. And what you see is I've got plenty of vitamins on board. I don't meet the RDAs for vitamin D, but nobody expects us to get that from our food. We get that from sunlight. I have plenty of minerals, including calcium. And we have plenty of uh, fiber. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some of my preliminary research data. Do not take photos of these slides, okay? So please, no photos coming forward. Uh, with us is our preliminary data on the first wave that came through on the changes in the biomarkers. No pictures. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, things that you want to go down. C-reactive protein, that's a marker of inflammation. Triglycerides, a marker of uh, insulin sensitivity, LDL. Uh, body mass index, everybody loses weight. Homocysteine, an indicator that your brain's on fire because you can't metabolize your B vitamins very well. Things you want to go up, high density lipo, uh, lipoprotein, folate levels, and B12 levels. So the biomarkers were changing in the correct direction. Uh, people did a short form 36, uh, these are 36 questions that you can analyze with subscales for a variety of uh, quality of life measures. This is general health, and uh, what you'll see is for some of these subjects, they have a steady improvement because you wanna get up to 100 uh, in terms of uh, quality of life. Subject uh, eight, uh, we had to withdraw from the study because she had such serious cognitive decline. She was no longer competent, and she was not able to implement our study interve interventions. Uh, I'll tell you subject uh, three uh, who came to us. Uh, it took her, um, I believe, about 80 seconds to walk 25 feet at the end of 12 months. She was able to do that with uh, about 22 seconds with her walker. Subject 11 came to us uh, needing a cane for short distances, a walker for long distances. She can now jog. Yeah, I think we should applaud that. Uh, this is fatigue severity scales, and uh, the seven questions that they answer in terms of how the, the fatigue uh, has impacted their life. The people who have the black star had clinical meaningful improvement in fatigue. Uh, the FDA approved treatments for fatigue with provigil, 
got uh, FDA approval when they were able to show a 0.5 level of improvement. Our mean improvement was 1.9. There's no literature that comes close to this. Uh, and so we had uh, subjects 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, and 11 have cli clinical, clinically meaningful improvements in their fatigue. Okay? Um, at this point, uh, we are now enrolling uh, primary progressives and secondary progressives in the second uh, wave. Uh, and what we are doing uh, is we're introducing the supplements at six months so we can see how important the supplements are in the study. Uh, we have our two primary progressives uh, that came in for their uh, three-month follow-up. You know, and I was uh, sort of concerned uh, adding primary progressives. They're not likely to improve. It's much more difficult to show any improvements for them. And, of course, we weren't giving them their supplements. So I expected that hopefully they wouldn't get worse. Well, gal darn, I was wrong. Uh, so subject 18 uh, came to us needing two canes to walk 25 feet. Uh, when she came in for three months, she was able to walk 25 feet, no canes. Come on, y'all applaud. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And let's see, I think. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about my primary care clinics. Uh, the question is, is this generalizable to other brain conditions, other uh, medical problems? When we look at the basic science, of uh, disease, we see that for all of these conditions, the mitochondria are not working very well. And there's inappropriate inflammation in the bloodstream and in the cell tissues. Uh, and those are mental health problems, uh, like depression, bipolar, anxiety, obsessive compulsive, eating disorders, dementia, learning disability, autism, schizophrenia, and of course, MS. In the medical problems of high blood pressure, arthritis, headache, fatigue, allergies, asthma, lung disease, atherosclerosis, heart disease, diabetes, uh, and obesity. The latest basic science research uh, is identifying atherosclerosis as an autoimmune problem. This kind of intervention is what I use in my clinics, in my traumatic brain injury clinics, and I see uh, remarkably uh, positive results. Yep, costs more money uh, to do this. Uh, now, in my clinics and in my uh, public classes, I talk about the importance of growing your own food, uh, buying food from your local farmer, getting organic food. Uh, this is uh, the real health care policy changes that we need. So back to the Chinese proverb, uh, for a long time, I was an inferior physician. But I think finally now, I'm moving to the superior physician. I'm teaching the public and my patients how to prevent disease and achieve optimal health. And the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patient in the care of the human frame, the proper diet, and the cause and prevention of disease. You guys are the doctors of the future. I salute you. Okay, now. So, it was my, we have some q and I try to get through all this so we'd have an uh, opportunity to answer questions for you guys. Um, I always wonder about remi um, relapsing, remitting MS, having good periods. And so when you're doing testing, you don't know if the person is just going through yes. a spell. But the fact that you're using secondary and primary progressives, do you think that that takes that piece out of your That is research? exactly why our first study is uh, secondary and primary progressives. So Nobody expects uh, those people to have improved function. Now, we are doing a, um, our, our next study uh, that actually I'm funding with the proceeds from uh, Minding My Mitochondria will be relapsing remitting and we'll have a wait list control. Good, thanks. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Get close, yeah. yes. Uh, so first of all, I feel like this is kind of a, these are very minor questions in the grand scheme of what you're doing. But since you put an emphasis on cooking and how, or how it's prepared, I want to ask two questions. One was on, uh, sorry, one was on the form of uh, K2, because I feel like I've heard both people talk about MK7, MK4, and I forget if it was on Chris Kresser's blog or someone else where they talked about the more active form, like showing more 
uh, ac efficacy was the MK4 form, and I didn't know if you had. We, we don't have that data. Uh, we're not measuring our uh, vitamin K values, so I don't really know that. Okay. Um, people eat a lot of greens uh, on our diet, uh, and we certainly shift their gut bacteria by uh, ramping up the fiber. Uh, it would be a, I wish we had enough money to measure all those things. Um, and then my other question was when you talked about uh, the cooking with water-soluble vitamins. Now, I thought it was just that, you know, you might lose some of them, but I've actually heard of people who will cook rice in the, the solution that they cook the vegetables in, and then they reabsorb, say, like vitamin C into the rice. Um, so my question is, are you actually degrading the vitamin C where it's not usable at all from the cooking, or is it just seeping out? But if you eat that liquid or, or you drink the liquid or... I would so. say the, uh, the answer is not really no. Okay. Yes. Yes. I was wondering... Will this approach, do you believe, work with everyone with MS or a certain subset of people with MS, or is that? Um, I expect that it will work with many. Um, this is sort of the public health version. For people who uh, does not work, uh, I recommend a toxicology screening for looking for heavy metals, uh, looking for uh, a stool analysis for what's growing uh, in the stool. Are there uh, parasites, yeast? And then there's uh, chronic uh, infections such as uh, Lyme, Chlamydia, Bartonella, uh, Babesiosis. So it won't work for everyone. P I think people will benefit from a functional medicine eval. But from a public health message, uh, will this work for 80 percent, 90 percent, 95 percent? That part I don't know yet. Thank you. You're welcome. How would you grade your own recovery in terms of return of capability and function? Okay, so here are the things. Um, so in 2007, can't sit up. I can now jog around my backyard uh, three laps. Uh, I, uh, I can stand, uh, before breaking my arm, uh, I could easily stand for two hours uh, giving lectures, walk two miles. Since breaking my arm, um, I'm impressed that the metabolic energy it took uh, to heal uh, set me back on my heels. Uh, I'd have a hard time walking a mile now. And I was not confident I could stand for the whole lecture, which is why I'm uh, giving it sitting. So I certainly have lost some ground having broken my bones. Uh, I predicted that it would take me 10 years to recover. Uh, I've made pretty good uh, recovery uh, in the five years. I think there's uh, a ways to go. Uh, for example, I, I do my uh, taekwondo warm-up kicks. I can do a side kick about six inches off the ground uh, and pivot forward kick, pivot back without falling. Uh, so I, I'm making continual progress, but by no means am I cured. If I, you know, when I'm traveling uh, and I can't eat the way that I uh, like to eat, uh, that becomes a problem for me. If I uh, get some sauces on my food, get some gluten, I will have a flare of my face pain, which uh, is like a electrical jolts of, uh, of pain that uh, in a matter of hours can be so devastating that I'm not able to speak. Um, so that keeps me very, very compliant uh, on my diet. <laughs> it also means that when I travel, you know, I have a bag of sprouted nuts and a bag of uh, liver jerky and uh, powdered algae so uh, I, I can maintain my diet more effectively while traveling. Thank you. And, and I would also say this is one of the easier places I've gone to because you guys are actually feed, feed me food that I can eat. So thank you. Hi, it's Glenn Brooks from Vibrant Living. I just wanted to see if you could comment more about the, uh, the raw meats. Like I, I do travel and I see this, they have grass-fed meats yeah. Like a Trader Joe's. I was wondering if you could comment about eating it, eating the so uh, discernment around eating raw meat right. on the travel. So uh, raw meat, uh, the advantage to having your meat raw, you're going to have more of the uh, vitamins, the minerals uh, intact, uh, and the meat will begin to auto digest in your stomach. You'll need fewer enzymes from your pancreas to digest that food. The hazard of eating your meat raw is the public health hazard of uh, parasites and bacterial infections. Because of our conventional farming, uh, that now becomes a much higher risk uh, proposition. If you can buy your meat uh, from farmers that you know, you know the health of the animal, you're decreasing the risk somewhat. If you have the meat in a deep freeze uh, for at least 14 days, you're gonna decrease uh, the risk of parasites. 
Um, but there are certainly public health concerns. Eating enzymes with your food is another way of dealing with uh, those issues. Um, I buy my meat from directly from the farmer. I would be uh, nervous about getting meat commercially and eating it raw. Any other tips about traveling and, and your food? I've learned the hard way to bring a lot of food with me. Yes. Um, Dr. Walls, you put a lot of emphasis on supplements. Can you go into more details what supplements you use and how, which supplements are important, especially for the pain? You mentioned pain for the face. So um, I have a long list of supplements. I talk about them uh, in the book. Uh, we have a, a lengthy list. What we have done in the second wave is people who have a high homocysteine, we put them on methylfolate, methyl B12, and a B complex. Uh, and then uh, we add sulfur amino acids and the cosahexaenoic acid and a variety of other things after that. Thank you. You're and welcome. Any of them particularly important for pain or heart? Uh, the most important thing for pain is following the diet to the letter. That is absolutely the most important. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Yes. And when you talk about mitochondria, to me, medium-chain triglycerides always come up as a good energy source and yes. also you know, mitochondrially healthy. Um, so do you consider that an important part of your diet or any other fatty acids that you particularly focus on? So uh, people lose weight. Uh, everybody loses weight on our diet. Uh, when they lose weight uh, and they get into a uh, body mass index that's too low, we have them ramp up uh, medium chain triglycerides, uh, adding uh, coconut oil. And I have them take sprouted uh, walnuts, uh, raisins, and uh, coconut oil, and uh, make a, uh, add some cocoa and cinnamon and make a coconut oil fudge. And we feed that to them ad lib. Uh, I also ask them to eat more uh, liver and more organ meat uh, during that time. So it's more of a mass, or it's for weight gain, not as part of the diet normally? Uh, it's part of uh, weight gain uh, because uh, it was not what I did originally. Uh, it's in our next study. Uh, we will be using uh, medium chain triglycerides. You know, it's, it's really quite remarkable that I got the Institutional Review Board to approve my study. Uh, because it's so comprehensive, so complex. Uh, it, and the whole reason why the IRB approved it is I'm a member of the IRB. They saw me get in the wheelchair. They saw me look like shit. And then they saw me suddenly walking, you know, riding my bike. Uh, and so when I, uh, they were interested in having me uh, do this study. The pharmacy and th uh, therapeutics committee uh, said, no, it's no safety data. We can't approve this. Uh, so then I rewrote my study without the supplements. Uh, the IRB disapproved that study. I was really upset. But then they called me and called in the head of pharmacy and said, you work it out. We want to approve the study. She needs to do it exactly the way she did with all of her supplements. You tell her what safety lab she needs and who to exclude. So that's how uh, we got into the study. Now our next study, we will stress coconut oil more. Thank you very much. I think your talk and what you've done is fantastic. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Walsh, over on this side. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading lately about the similarities of MS and chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Yes. It's kind of my area of expertise because I've dealt with it for over 15 years. Um, and the more I read, the more it seems like a very vicious cycle with cytokines and all these terrible things going on in the mitochondria basically destroying them. Um, and it, it seems like eating and supplementation uh, it's pretty difficult to break that vicious cycle in some cases. And from my experience, I still deal with the symptoms. And like you said, you're still progressing, but just at a slower rate. Um, my main question would be exercise. Um, based on what I read, it seems like exercise is a terrible idea given the state of our mitochondria. I just wondered what you thought about that. Um, exercise, uh, we designed an exercise program for everyone in our study based on uh, where they're at, and we progress that. Uh, it's easier to do when we add the electrical stimulation of the muscles. I think exercise is a, an important part of recovery, um, but it has to be paced very carefully to the individual. If you go too fast, uh, you lose ground quickly. Can you describe the electrical muscle stimulation? I'm also a chiropractor. I'll talk with you about that uh, outside. Okay. Thank you. 
it's an honor to hear you talk. Thank you so much. Um, two part question, I'll try to be um, short about it, but um, one is uh, with supplementation, there's a lot of uh, controversy on um, synthetic versus whole food supplements. Yes. And have you um, t done any work with um, comparing the two and if that makes a difference? And the second part is the diet that you've set um, is, well, is similar to a lot of the anti-inflammatory diets that yes. people use yes. for irritable bowel syndrome, which then increases bioavailability. And so I wonder if over time, um, I guess that second part is, is the, does the diet require supplementation or over time do you find that you can actually wean off them because you're getting more from the diet as you decrease inflammation? Um, these are great questions. We don't know. Uh, I, I do know, uh, uh, being sort of cheap, I was running out of my supplements. I ordered them online. I was going to miss them for a couple days, and so I thought, no big deal. Uh, my face pain turned on uh, horrifically. ended up in the ER with uncontrollable pain. It was miserable. Uh, and then, and I'm stupid enough, I let that happen a second time. Uh, well, I'm not so stupid to do it a third time. So I've, I uh, am very, very slow about making any supplement change. That is why uh, in our second wave, we are starting the supplements at six months so I can get a better sense of how important the supplements are. A and that's par par partly why I was so surprised that our primary progressives were better. I thought, wow, that's pretty exciting. So you will publish the work on supplement versus non-supplement? So I plan on uh, writing and publishing all of this stuff. That's why I didn't want you guys to uh, take pictures for me. Uh, now I'm writing and submitting grants, and the neurologists who review my stuff say, it's very clear Dr. Walls uh, does not understand the pathophysiology of, of MS. Um, and so I think there's going to be some very high barriers uh, for publication because people accuse me of cooking the data and all sorts of uh, terrible stuff. Uh, but we will try. My uh, research assistant's uh, writing this up, and our goal was to have uh, uh, wave one submitted uh, by the end of August. Probably the Journal of Complementary Alternative. Oh, time is up. Sorry. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>